Good morning, Four Corners. Blessing to be together. I hope that that is why you are here this morning, to adore our Lord. That is what we do when we sing, when we pray, when we practice baptism. Uh, that is what we do when we preach. We preach in adoration of the Lord, and we listen to preaching and instruction in adoration to the Lord. So let him be adored today in this service, this first Sunday of Advent. I hope that all of you had a nice Thanksgiving with your families and that you were freshly reminded of how much you have to be thankful for. You know, it's, uh, it is easy to drift from gratitude. We're going to talk a little about gratitude conveniently. That's a, a big topic this morning, kind of coming out of Thanksgiving. We're going to talk about that this morning a little later. But just want you to consider how much you have to be thankful for to God. It is easy to drift from that. In our sinfulness, there is a tendency for us to focus on what we don't have. You know, and the greed of the human heart is such that we never have enough of anything. Never have enough comfort, enough rest, enough uh, money, enough satisfaction, enough whatever. Just fill in the blank. We're never satisfied by earthly goods because we're only satisfied in Christ. And so there's a tendency in all of us to focus on those things that we lack, whatever it may be, or to highlight in our lives what's negative as we see it, quote unquote negative. Uh, but I pray that for us as Christians, as we celebrated Thanksgiving, which is a, a, a national holiday, something that we, we celebrate, and it means lots of different things, lots of different people. I suppose Christmas is the same way. But for us Christians, we recognize that at the center of our lives is this thanksgiving to God. And that all of life is a gift. A gift from our Heavenly Father. Thanksgiving is a time for Christians to be refreshed in our Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 way of life. We read this there in Colossians 3. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Notice there that our thanksgiving to God is through the Lord Jesus. It's through our Lord Jesus. We're not just giving thanks to some unspecified deity. It's one of the things that frustrated me this past, uh, well, two years ago at the presidential inauguration. It's this sort of, this vague sense of deity. And we know that in our culture today, that's been even zapped uh, further, been watered down even further. We do not give thanks to some vague sense of deity, some generalized God that stands over and watches over our country, our families, our, our world. We give thanks to God the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our thanksgiving is specific. It is through Christ. And so my prayer for us is that this Christocentric Thanksgiving will define us as a church. And it will define our families as we celebrate Advent and Christmas over the next month. That our Thanksgiving would be present, first and foremost, but that it would be Christocentric. That we would be thanking God for everything we have in and through Jesus Christ. If you would, go with me in your Bibles to Romans 14. That's where we are today in our series through Romans. Romans 14, verses 5 to 12. Last week, we looked at verses 1 to 4. And the title of the sermon was Welcoming While Differing. And Paul, in this section, really, that runs from 14.1 all the way to 15.13. It's the last major section of teaching in Paul's most famous letter, Paul's epistle to the Romans. And in this section, Paul is dealing with differences among the Christians in Rome. There are the weak and the strong, <clears throat> these two groups of people within the church. And, and Paul doesn't say a lot to specify this. He doesn't uh, give us much indication as to the extent of this problem. But the fact that he spends this amount of time in this letter on this issue 
though he commends the Romans, I think we need to recognize that there is some tension there within this church or this uh, conglomeration of house churches. And so he is dealing with these two groups, the weak and the strong. The weak appear to be Jews and some Gentiles who are a conscientious bunch. They are conscientious about continuing certain Old Testament practices. These are individuals who have embraced Christ for salvation, but are living very much still in light of, in relation to the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law. They refrain from meat and wine, probably because they cannot ensure that it is kosher there in the city of Rome. And they continued to observe certain holy days. They are weak in faith, as Paul describes them, because they have yet to work out the implications of the gospel for their freedom in these matters. It is not that these individuals are looking to these things for salvation. Otherwise, Paul would have rebuked them sharply, as we see uh, in the case of the Galatians, or uh, they, they're following some false teaching, some heresy, as we see Paul rebuking in Colossians. It is not that, but it is, in, it is instead that they have failed to work out the implications of the gospel for their freedom in these matters. And this has caused some binding of their consciences before God. The strong, by contrast, see all foods... And all days alike. No distinction between foods and no distinction between days. They practice Christian liberty in these matters. They are free in Christ. They have understood the implications of the gospel for these Old Testament religious observances. So the weak and the strong. And Paul's desire is that The Christians love one another in the midst of these differences, that they welcome one another, that they refrain from despising one another or judging one another. That was the temptation or the pitfall for the weak. They were judging the strong for doing these things, for eating these things, and for not observing these days. And the strong were looking down on the weak, As I said last week, kind of patting them on the head, uh, very much rubbing their weakness in faith, their, their bound consciences in their face, looking down on them as subpar Christians. So that was last week, welcoming while differing. The title for the sermon this week, as we come to verses 5 to 12, so we covered verses 1 to 4 last week, this week 5 to 12, as we come to these verses... The title is Worshiping While Differing. Welcoming while differing last week, very much a horizontal focus. This week, worshiping while differing, very much a vertical emphasis. Paul's focus doesn't really change in verses 5 to 12. Uh, And in fact, this is really one larger section. I thought initially about doing this in part one and part two because chapter 14, verses one to 12, really does constitute the first major unit. But what we see is a a switch of emphasis when we come to verses five to 12. As verse 10 shows us, Paul is still concerned with the believers not despising or judging one another. He's still very much on that theme of unity and love and welcoming within the body among the believers as the weak do not judge the strong and as the strong do not despise the weak. We see that in verse 10. But in these verses, Paul is consumed with the theme of worship. That is the dominating theme As we walk through these verses, worship. His emphasis is the heart behind our choices, behind our actions, behind our observances. What is going on in the hearts of every believer? What matters is not so much what a person does. I want you to see that. This is not a black and white thing. Paul certainly has these categories. Weak. And strong. And they have meaning. 
Of course, it is better to be strong than weak. But what matters is not what these individuals are doing with regard to food or drink or days. What matters is why each individual is doing it. Why is this individual eating whatever? Why is this individual refraining from meat or drink? Wine, in this case. Why is this individual not observing days? And why is this individual observing those days? That is not the issue. The issue is the posture of the heart. For every single Christian in Rome, and for Paul himself, the issue is the posture of the heart. The intent and motivation behind the actions. And the reason for that is that the issue is really worship. That's what matters. And that's where Paul wants to focus his readers. So if you would go ahead and stand with me as we read God's word together. We're going to read uh, chapter 14 all the way up through verse 12. Just try to follow closely Paul's logic. You know, preaching is explaining God's word. Uh, you know, I've talked to our kids about this, and I say to them, you want to, as you grow up and you go off and you're on your own, you want to go to a church where God speaks. And what that means is you want to go to a church where the scriptures are explained, because when the scriptures are explained, God speaks. If I get up here and just tell you advice for life or certain morals or whatever, that's just man speaking, some guy speaking. We want to hear from the Lord. And so listen carefully as we read God's word. This is more important than even what I'm about to say. This is God's word. I'm going to do my best to explain it. But what we're about to read is the very word of the living God. Chapter 14, verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, <clears throat> while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And that's what we covered last week. And now for our verses for today. Verse 5. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. <clears throat> Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Those are precious words. Verse 9, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? So you see there he's returning back to his original theme. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. You can go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's pray and ask for the Lord's help <clears throat> in this preaching and listening as we come to his word. Father, we bow before you as our, our great God, our King, our Lord. You own us through Christ. You have purchased us. You are our creator. 
through Christ, your eternal word, through whom you spoke all things into existence. And you are our redeemer, through Christ, the incarnate word, through whom by his death and resurrection you have redeemed us for yourself as a people forever. God, we give you praise for your goodness, your kindness, your grace. We deserve nothing from your hand. We deserve condemnation. And yet you declare that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father, that through Christ you have you have removed our sin guilt. You have removed the stain of our debauchery and rebellion and selfishness and pride and greed and lust and hatred of our neighbor. You have nailed the laws against such things to the cross of Christ. You have nailed our sins to the cross of Christ. And through him, you have taken them away. We praise you for the gospel. We praise you for this Christ who is himself the center of the gospel. As you say through Paul at the beginning of Romans, as you define the gospel as concerning his son. God, we thank you that this gospel is all about Christ and that this gospel is the power that you have given for the salvation of men and women and boys and girls everywhere. Father, we pray that you would mightily bring salvation today to those who do not know Christ, to those who are still living for themselves, to those who are still guided by their own principles that they've made up for life, for happiness, for joy, for goodness. Lord, that you would shatter the false confidence that they have in these false gods and that you would put their eyes on this Christ, mighty to save, glorious in his incarnation, resurrection, ascension, and who will return gloriously for his people. God, we pray that Christ would be lifted up today. We pray that you would guide us as we come to your word, that you would help us to understand it rightly and help us to obey it faithfully. We pray for your mercy. Pray for your mercy as we seek to understand it and apply it to our own lives. We ask that your spirit would do the work of applying it. We know apart from him, we will lack understanding and we will lack faithfulness and obedience to it. So Lord, would he give us understanding and would he help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers? We pray over this time in Jesus' name, amen. So this worship that we carry out towards God in the midst of our differences, and that's what we need to consider, is that this is worship toward God in the midst of our differences. Isn't that quite a thought, that we could actually be part of a church and not agree on everything and have differences among us, and yet be ourselves worshiping God and view our brother or sister as worshiping God even in those differences. That's what Paul is trying to inculcate in his readers, his readers over the last 2,000 years, his Roman readers, and Paul envisioning, who knows how long Paul thought it would be before the Lord would would return. But throughout the centuries, for 2,000 years, Paul knowing as the apostle of Christ that Christ was speaking through him that Christians would come and read these words. They are as applicable to us today as they were in the first century. In the midst of our differences, we worship. And Paul describes this in two big ways. So these are our points for this morning. First, acknowledging his ownership And secondly, anticipating his judgment. That's the worship of our hearts as we are uh, differing among each other as as a body. 
as we have differences, and particularly in the case of the Jewish background in the first century, as they had these differences, they are worshiping in the midst of them, and they are doing that in these two ways, acknowledging God's ownership and anticipating his judgment. So for the first, we'll look at verses 5 to 9, and the second, verses 10 to 12. So let's go first to acknowledging his ownership, verses 5 to 9. This is what it says. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. You know, every time Advent comes around, uh, there's the question, are we going to leave where we're at to go and and, uh, and do something else for Advent. And of course, you know, when you read things like this, you just think, how could we leave? I mean, Christmas is written all over these texts. So far, Paul has only mentioned food, specifically meat, as a point of contention among the believers in Rome. Some abstain, some eat. But here, Paul adds the observance of days. And later on, as I said last week, he'll also add the drinking of wine. Some esteem one day as better than another, while other Christians see all days alike. No distinction in days. <clears throat> in a week, in a month, a year, periods of time. As I quoted last week, Colossians 2, 16 to 17, also mentions the observance of certain days. This is what Paul says there. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Paul's language seems to be comprehensive here with regard to days. Any day conceived of in any space of time. Then he goes on to say, these are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. And then Galatians 4.10 mentions the observance of days and months and seasons and years. So some of these Christians in Rome are holding on to the shadow. To use the language of Colossians, they are holding on to the shadow while others have understood that it was simply that. It was a shadow of the later substance that Christ has now come. And the shadow has been realized. Some understand that, yes, Christ has come, but that the shadow is still something they ought to do. It is still something that uh, forms a component of their obedience to Christ. It forms a component of their Christian life. But just as we saw with food, Paul doesn't get mired down in the theological questions concerning days. He could have done that. And elsewhere, he does deal with those issues, as we saw in Colossians and in 1 Corinthians 8 to 10. We see him dealing with some of those issues. But what we find here is Paul does not get mired down in the theological questions concerning days. Uh, this would have been a great point for Paul to spend three chapters discussing why it is that those days were a shadow and that they're no longer uh, binding on the Christian, that the substance has come. Of course, Paul could have taken time to, to give a theological discourse on this issue, but that's not what Paul does. Instead, he turns his reader's attention to the one big thing that should govern all of our conduct. We are owned by Christ and should direct everything back to him. That's, that's the Christian life. We are owned by Christ and we should direct everything 
back to him. What matters for the Christian is living under the Lord, belonging to him, being owned by him, living as his slave, as his possession purchased with his own blood. That's what matters. Not the days, not the food, not the drink. This, this ownership, this lordship of Christ is at the center of Christianity. And I, I, I need to say this, I can't pass this over, and that is maybe for you, when you think of being a Christian, you, you only think of Jesus my Savior, Jesus who has released me from sin and death, who's released me from hell, Jesus my Savior. But there's a reason that we speak of Jesus as our Savior and Lord. You don't know him as Savior if you don't know him as Lord. Because to be saved is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It is to believe that he is the God-man, that he came, that he died, he rose again. He rose in glory as Lord of all. And we are under him. See yourself as saved by him, but also see yourself as owned by him. You have given over the rights to your life, your soul, your thinking, your speaking, your acting, your dreams, your fulfillment. All of life has been handed over to Christ. Apart from that, there's no salvation. Christ must become our Lord when he becomes our Savior. This is at the center of Christianity. The Lordship of Christ is not a peripheral doctrine. It is not some sort of one of three or four. It, it is not a subpoint. It is the center. It is the heartbeat of all of the universe, all of the Christian faith, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Listen to this language, 2 Corinthians 5.15. Christ died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for, him, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Here's one of the easiest ways to recognize whether you are a Christian or not. Do you live for yourself? Do you live for yourself? Or do you live for Christ? Because what Paul is telling us here is that that is a, a fundamental aspect of the transformation that occurs when a person is converted, when a person becomes a Christian, is that they, they stop living for themselves and they start living for Christ. They become the possession, not of self, but of the one who died for them and purchased them. The world is filled with self-lovers, love of self. Augustine, St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, in his book, The City of God, that great work, the early church, describes that the city of man is defined by love of self. The city of God, by love of God. Love of self, love of God. Which city are you in? You can be in the same room and be in different cities. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. You are not your own, Paul says to the believers. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. At the center of the Christian faith is this notion of Christ purchasing us. He bought us. He laid down his life and he purchased us from sin. He purchased us from the enslavement to sin, from death, eternal death, from hell from separation from God, from self-destruction, from God's wrath against rebel sinners. Christ bought us with his own sacrificial death. We don't worship and follow a religious guru. We don't worship and follow just a, a, a great moral individual in history. We worship the Lamb of God who gave his life to take away our sin so that he might, as Lord, own his precious blood-bought people. So what matters is not food, 
<laughs> Even after thinking about those things, then you come to food and drink, you're like, what, what is that? Who cares? What matters is not food, drink, or days. What matters is living as those who are owned by Christ. Acknowledging his ownership, acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's more than just words we say. It's a life we live. So does your life say Jesus Christ is Lord? Let's break apart these verses a little bit, verses five to nine. I think we need to kind of break them apart. The, there's quite a bit here. And Paul gives us three parts of this living under Christ's lordship. There's more uh, than three here really, I think, but three big ones that we can kind of sink our teeth into. So verses five to nine, three parts of this living under Christ's ownership. And here they are, confidence, that's confidence in our minds, gratitude, gratitude towards God, and trust, trust in what Christ did. That is how we acknowledge his ownership. So first, confidence. We'll look at that one first. In verse five, Paul says that each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Did you notice those words? He, he says that and then he moves on. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Each one should be decided on his position. That means that as Paul sees these day observers and non-day observers, meat eaters, non-meat eaters, wine drinkers, and non-wine drinkers, and any other little thing that could be grouped into that, what he's saying is, be confident in your mind, decided as to what is right and wrong on these things, as you understand it, and move forward in that confidence. We know, we understand, and we think before the face of God. Always. Our conscience must remain clean before God. Always. Clean. Clean. Is your conscience clean before God? Listen to the way John MacArthur describes this. I think it's helpful. In matters that are not specifically commanded or forbidden in Scripture, which is the case with these things that Paul's dealing with, it is always wrong to go against conscience. Because our conscience represents what we actually believe to be right. Our conscience doesn't necessarily represent what is right, but it represents what we believe to be right. Do you see that? To go against our conscience, therefore, is to do that which we believe is wrong. And although an act or practice in itself may not be sinful, it is treated as sinful for those who are convinced in their own minds that it is wrong and it produces guilt. Let me give you another quote from Calvin. He kind of takes it from the other angle, which I think is even more pertinent to what Paul is saying here. He says, it is an act of impiety to undertake anything, whatever, which you think will displease him, nay, which you are not persuaded will please him, to undertake anything that you are not persuaded will please God. What matters for the Christian is obeying his or her Lord. The pleasure of God's face, pleasing God, that is what matters for the believer. So Paul says here that each one should be fully convinced or persuaded on the matter. A Christian should only do those things which he or she believes will please the Lord. Our consciences, God works in them to guide us in this life. And we want to please our Lord. 
Notice that this is not careless living. That's the, one of the big things we need to see here is Paul is, is more concerned to say here, don't live carelessly than he is to say, be strong. Notice that. He's more concerned to say, live with integrity before the face of God than he is to say, make sure you get this one right. A Christian should only do those things which they believe please the Lord. And this cannot be careless living. This is a call to study. It is a call to meditate, to pray, to seek counsel, so that our consciences, though imperfect, can be well informed, so that our minds can become persuaded so that we can direct our actions to the Lord. Because in order to direct our actions to the Lord, we need to be doing that which we believe to be right. So have a well-formed conscience. Listen to your conscience. Pray to God about your conscience. So that's the first word, confidence. Second, we see gratitude. Look at verse 6 again. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. Notice that. Since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. The big idea here is doing something unto the Lord. Like Colossians 3.23 says. Whatever you do, do it as for the Lord. But how do we do that? How do we do something as for the Lord? That sounds really pious. It sounds really holy. It sounds really ideal. But how is it, practically speaking, that we do the things we do as unto the Lord or for the Lord? The answer is gratitude. The answer is that we give thanks. Let me give you another really helpful quote. In this case, from John Stott, he says, Whether one is an eater or an abstainer, the same two principles apply. If we are able to receive something from God with thanksgiving as his gift to us, then we can offer it back as our service to him. The two movements from him to us and from us to him belong together and are vital aspects of our Christian discipleship. Both are valuable and practical tests. And here they are, these two questions. Can I thank God for this? Can I, before I do this thing, fill in the blank, can I give God thanks for this with a clear conscience? And can I do this Unto the Lord as worship. Thanksgiving is the key to worship. And for the Christian, it is the key to right conduct. So Paul says it this way in 1 Timothy 4, 4 4-5. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. And this is one of the reasons that we pray before meals. Is we want to stop before we just cram our faces. No matter how hungry we are. This is difficult sometimes with kids. They're just starving. Or they think they are. And cram in our faces before we just stop. And we give God thanks for what he has done provided. For the Christian, all of life is thanksgiving. Every meal is a thanksgiving meal. We direct this back to God in gratitude. And then the third word I want to give you for this, acknowledging his ownership, is trust. So we've seen confidence, we see gratitude, and now finally this word, trust. In verses 7 to 9, Paul describes how we live unto the Lord because we belong to the Lord. Nothing we do is excluded. 
Uh, Paul uses comprehensive language here. All of life is included, and even death. In all of life, and even in death, whatever we do, we do unto the Lord. Think about that. We just worship God right up until and through death. That's an amazing thought. That as a person is dying, they are worshiping as they are dying unto the Lord. That is incredible. Dying unto the Lord. The world knows nothing of that. Those who are not Christians know nothing of that. It is cling to life now. It's all I have. After this, that's it. Or you don't know what's after this. Either fatalistic or agnostic. But all you have is this. And the Christian says, even in death, I will die unto the Lord. And this is not just for the martyr. This is for all of us, all of us, when that hour of death comes, and it's coming for each and every one of us. Who knows when, but it's coming. And when it comes, may we remember these words, and may we die unto Christ. Die unto the Lord. And then in verse 9, Paul says that it is for this very purpose that Christ died and rose again. He has established his lordship over all of his people, whether they live or die. Notice that. Christ came and he died and was raised in order to establish his lordship over his people. That's how important Christ's ownership, Christ's lordship is to the Lord. Christ has passed through death. And he has been raised again to life in all of our existence. We belong to this crucified and raised Christ. And so here's that verse, that wonderful verse, verse 8. Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. These are precious words. Precious words for the people of God. You know, this absolutely transforms how we think about death. And it should for us, if meditated upon and if understood, it should for us abolish all fear of death. All fear of death abolished, destroyed, done away with. Because whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ. He holds us in his hand and no one can take us out of his hand. In life or in death, he owns us. Praise God, we belong to him and he will never let us go. And guess what? He's the king. He's the conqueror. There is no one greater. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Satan's head has been and will be crushed. He will be thrown into the fire. Who could possibly remove us from Christ's safety? No one. There is no fear of death because we die as those who belong to the one who died and lived again. This means that our living unto the Lord as his possession must be explicitly built upon our trust. It's back to the word trust must be built upon our trust in his death, burial, and resurrection. Do you see the logic here? All traced back to our trust in the gospel. There's no way that we're going to live the way Paul's describing. There's no way that we're going to live as those who are owned by Christ, as those who see Christ as Lord, as those who moment by moment do what we do as unto the Lord. There's no way we're going to practically do that unless all of that is built on a firm, explicit Trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the reason Paul makes such a a big deal of it in 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel is the basis for all of our living. A crucified, buried, and raised Christ stands at the center of our trust, at the center of our living, and at the center of our dying. So each of us can die well, can die in faith. So our actions are governed by Christ's ownership. And this plays out in our confidence, our gratitude, and our trust. And now finally we come to our second point this morning. And that is anticipating his 
judgment. As we worship the Lord amidst our differences, we are acknowledging his ownership and we are anticipating his judgment. Look at verses 10 to 12. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? He's speaking to everybody. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. That is sobering. That is sobering for all of us. We're just going about life, right? Just thinking about what's in front of us. Think about what lies ahead. In verses 5 to 9, well, let me say it this way. If verses 5 to 9 focus on our present experience, what we just looked at focuses on our present experience, living unto the Lord as those who are owned by him, then verses 10 to 12 focus on what lies ahead in the future, what will come. And the same idea, you'll notice here, is repeated in each verse. We will stand before God in judgment. So notice how it is, it is repeated in each of these verses. Verse 10, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Verse 11, a quote from Isaiah 45, 23. Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And then in verse 12, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Christians will stand before God's judgment. We will stand before the judge. Though the wrath has been removed from us and placed on Christ, we still love and serve God as our judge. How could it be any other way? God is just, and one who is just must judge. Everything must be put in the light. Everything must be seen for what it is. And God's justice will stand. Ultimately, for those of us in Christ, we will be covered in Christ's righteousness, clothed in him, and we will inherit eternal life. But all must give an account. In the context, Paul seems to be drawing out three implications for his readers. So I'm going to finish with these three implications. The big idea, of course, here is judgment, God's future judgment. But this, I think, for Paul, in this context, is meant to do three things in his readers. It's meant to do three things in us as we leave here today. First, don't despise or judge because God is going to do the judging later on. That's really the main idea here. Paul has just said, look, don't despise and don't judge. God is the judge, and God is going to judge. He is the rightful judge, and he will carry out his judgment. That's his job, not our job, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And as 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, our judgment is premature. We have no right to judge on these matters. We have no right to stand over the servant of another, who is Christ, we have no right to knock God off of his judgment seat and take that place. We have no right in our own sinfulness to presume that we can be someone else's judge. But also, we recognize our judgment is premature. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. The commendation from God will be based on the heart. Guess what? I can't see your heart. You can't see my heart. Now we recognize that the fruit demonstrates a lot about the heart. And part of our job as elders is to shepherd the heart's of the people whom God has entrusted to our care and the hearts of one another. And part of our job as parents is to shepherd the hearts of our children. But at the end of the day, there's only one who has pure, perfect vision of every heart. And that is the Lord. And he will come. And he will pull out the heart. And he will give it a good inspection. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 8 to 10. 
Yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Paul is talking about whether we live in this world or whether we go on and die, we make it our aim always to please him. That's always the desire of the Christian. Please the Lord, please the Lord, please the Lord, please the Lord. And then he says this right after that. For, why do we make it our desire to please him? Why? Anytime you see that word for, it's answering the question why. Not always. Sometimes it's just explaining. But typically it's answering the question why. So let me reread that. We make it our aim to please the Lord. Why? Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. It motivates us. Standing before the Lord one day should motivate you. It should motivate you to purge sin from your life, to maintain a clear, clean conscience, to not judge your brother and sister in matters like this, to love and seek unity, to stand up for the truth, to hate sin, to abhor what is evil, to hold fast to what is good to love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor, to submit to the governing authorities and to live as children of the day and not children of the night. We are motivated by the fact that each of us, without mom and dad, without your kids, without your spouse, alone, will stand before this Christ. It's coming. You're not going to have anyone there with you. None of us will. Us and our Lord. And eyes that see perfectly into every single heart. Every single deed. Every single thought. Every single motive. And praise God. That in all the imperfections of our motives and all the lack of purity in our hearts, that in the end, Christ is our Redeemer. We've been rescued from our sin. And though even today, as we think about our motives, as we think about our hearts, how, how uh, twisted and, and duplicitous and, and turned inward often our hearts are. But through Christ, by the Spirit, we live before his face with a clear conscience, awaiting, standing before him, his judgment seat. Third, and finally, beware. This is the third implication, the third sort of practical outworking of what Paul is saying about this judgment. Beware, lest in our judgment of others we incur the judgment of our Lord. Matthew 7, verses 1 to 2. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It amazes me the way that people online speak about their brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes the things you hear. And we're not talking about those who have have acquiesced to the LGBTQ revolution or those who have denied essential aspects of the gospel or those who don't recognize the authority of Scripture. As the sole authority for the Christian. We're talking about all kinds of differences and the way in which Christians online on their little blogs and their little videos will speak of other blood-bought saints of Christ, other believers, others for whom Christ died. Listen to Christ, your Christ, my Christ. Judge not that you be not judged, For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Think about this Christ and think about his tribunal when you quickly, hastily, carelessly tear down your brother, your sister in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us your scriptures. We thank you that you have taken hold of our consciences, our lives, by Christ, our Redeemer. We thank you that he owns us.
that he has purchased us, that he rules over us. Father, we ask you to guide us in worship, acknowledging who Christ is to us, looking forward to that day when we alone will stand before this Christ. Help us live now in the present, knowing that that day is coming. And it is coming far sooner than we could imagine. Even if we live a long life, Lord, this life is a breath. It is a fading flower. It is a mist, of a vapor. Soon we'll be, we will be before that tribunal. We praise you, God, that we are clothed in the righteousness of your Son, that we have been covered with his redeeming, perfect, sacrificial blood. We thank you that there is no condemnation. In your judgment, there will be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father, that on that day, though we see our works and how broken they were and we see how self-centered so much of what we did was and and we realize how twisted our motives were and how cluttered our consciences were we thank you God that in that day the glory of the gospel of grace will shine and Christ will shine and we will be grateful eternally for the fact that we are not being judged for our sins. God, we thank you for the gospel of this Christ. We thank you for this season of Advent where we get to really put a spotlight on his coming. And we get to also anticipate his second coming. Lord, help us as a church to, and as families to really dive into Advent, to the truths of Advent this year. Help us to be immersed, to immerse ourselves in meditating on these gospel truths, these glorious truths, these truths that, that confound the mind, these unsearchable, inscrutable riches. Help us to dig into them, to give ourselves to them. Father, would you be with us now as we celebrate the Lord's Supper? In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll be serving